All right, so hello and welcome back. So now we're at part three for Napoleon's Marshals. Thank you to my patrons, they're listed above. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon and having special access to a lot of stuff, please click the link in the description. Otherwise, up there should be part two if you missed that. Um, otherwise, we shall begin. So far, we've met Marshals Perigno, Brune, Serrouillet, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jordan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, and Marmont. Thirteen. Marshal Saint Cyr. He is the best man among us in the line of defense, though I'm superior to him in attack. Marshal Saint Cyr. Kind of describes me. Uh, usually in any war game I play, I'm very, very, very good in defense and offense. Unless I am supported, I can do offense, but I'm not a brilliant offensive man. Defensively, sure. Then that's what Marshal uh, Saint Cyr was. And I kind of wonder what happened to him because I don't remember him being in the Battle of France 1814, which he probably would have been very good in. Gouvion Saint Cyr was a gifted student who ran away from a miserable childhood to become an artist. A passionate Republican, he embraced the French Revolution and later volunteered for military service. Though proud and aloof by nature, his Republican politics and sharp intellect ensured he was elected captain of his company. His skill at drawing enemy positions then got him noticed by General Custin, who gave him a job on his staff. During these turbulent early years of the Revolution, Custine was one of several generals who was punished for defeat with a trip to the guillotine. Saint-Cyr's instinctive grasp of warfare, brilliant planning and tactics won him promotion from volunteer to general of division in two years. That is, again, very fast. Elected captain major in uh, 70 or 93. January, not even a few months later, colonel and then general division. That is a very fast rank of promotion. But again, this is turbulent times during the revolution. An even more remarkable achievement as he'd had no formal military training. That really is. With no formal military training, that's yeah, it was really good. But his cold, analytical approach meant that he was always a respected leader rather than loved. After five years' service with the army... Which basically means... Instead of like Marshal Ney, he's more like Napoleon calculating and thinking. Although Napoleon was also loved, so I'd have to go with Davout. He'd be more like Davout than he was Ney. More analytical, a way to approach war, which means the troops aren't in love with him, but they respect him for what he's capable of doing. Army of the Rhine, he was sent to Italy. At the disastrous Battle of Novi, he commanded the French right wing, but skillfully extricated his troops from the debacle. The next year he was back on the Rhine and won a brilliant victory over the Austrians at Bibrach. But a bitter dispute with his commander, General Moreau, encouraged rumours that saint was impossible to work with. saint believed soldiers should not meddle in politics and did not support Napoleon's seizure of power in 1799. Nor did he show much enthusiasm for Napoleon's decision to crown himself emperor five years later. His political views cost him dearly. saint was sidelined for several years, while less able generals were made marshals. In 1805, he commanded French forces in central Italy. But when he was made subordinate to Marshal Massena, a man whom he personally detested, he returned to Paris, even when Napoleon threatened to have him shot for desertion. In 1808, saint was given command of a corps for the invasion of Spain, but his failure to take Girona meant he was relieved of command. Leaving in a fury before his replacement, Marshal Augereau, had arrived, he was nearly court-martialed again for desertion. saint military talent, however, was not in doubt. So he's more brash, is what I'm getting here. He... He kind of likes that, that everything is set up in his way, and he really does not operate very effectively at all as an offensive field commander, which can be bad. 
1812, he was recalled for the Russia campaign, with command of 6th Bavarian Corps. His role was to support Marshal Oudinot in guarding the northern flank of the French salient. When Wittgenstein's Russians attacked at Polotsk, Oudinot was wounded, and saint took over command, turning probable defeat into a brilliant victory. For this achievement, Napoleon awarded saint his Marshal's Baton. But two months later, at a second Battle of Polotsk, saint was attacked by a larger Russian army, seriously wounded in the foot and forced to pull back. His injury meant he missed the worst horrors of the Russian retreat, but he contracted typhus early in 1813 and was sick for many months. Typhoid fever could very easily kill you, even in this time, it's still very, it could easily have killed him. saint returned to the Grande Armée in August, taking command of 14th Corps and the defence of Dresden. Incredibly, this was the first and only time that he worked directly alongside the Emperor, and both soon learned new respect for each other's abilities. saint skilled defence of Dresden set the stage for Napoleon's great victory there later that month. I was wondering who was defending Ten Corps at Dresden, because they did actually hold up Schwarzenberg and let Napoleon get over there and kick his ass. Let's be very frank, he kicked his ass. Um, and doing that with a single corps against an entire army is very... Uh, you have to be skilled. Even if it's a defensive campaign, you still have to be skilled to do so. But saint was incredulous when Napoleon later ordered him to remain in Dresden, while other forces concentrated for the decisive Battle of Leipzig, 60 miles to the west. Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig meant that saint and other garrisons in the east were cut off and had to surrender that autumn. saint took no part in the Hundred Days, determined to keep out of France's political disputes. Oh, so he wasn't able to, okay. So he wasn't able to take a part in the defense of France, which I'm assuming he would have been very good at in uh, for Napoleon, especially if he was uh, stationed in Paris. He would have actually probably held on. But he had to surrender Dresden in 1813 uh, after Napoleon defeated Leipzig. If you go look, uh, Dresden is right here. Okay, so Dresden's here. You see, because Napoleon lost at Leipzig, he was forced to surrender, which means he could no longer participate in 1814 campaign because they did not exchange prisoners or anything. Um, so that's... Now I know why he wasn't there. He would have been very good in 1814, at least in my opinion would have been very good for the defense of France. And he didn't take part in the 100 days, which makes sense because he didn't really, soldiers shouldn't be in politics and he didn't really support Napoleon in that way. 100 days, determined to keep out of France's political disputes. Under the restored monarchy, he served as minister of war and tried but failed to save Marshal Ney from the death penalty. He also struggled to enact military reforms in the face of royalist opposition. I like this dude a lot. He tried to save Ney. My opinion, controversial as it is, Ney shouldn't have been shot. Controversially, he did say he'd bring Napoleon back in a cage, um, went over there and then defected from the monarchy at that point, but literally everyone did. So it's not special to Ney, but I guess Ney was the in charge of that special detachment. Um, probably should have all tiles and everything, but uh, but made Minister of War, which basically is a Secretary of Defense for us in the United States, kind of shammy, something like that. Eventually resigning in disgust and retiring to his country estate. Marshal saint remains one of the great what-ifs of the Napoleonic Wars. An extremely able commander sidelined for his politics, who might well have proved one of Napoleon's very best marshals. Very well could have, and I'm also in that camp of he very, very well might have been one of the best defensive guys if Napoleon had used him earlier. It's just what if. 12. Marshal Udino. A decent fellow, not, but not very bright. It's a kind of scathing. Nicola Udino ran away to join the army aged 17 but his father dragged him home three years later to help run the family business. When the revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard 
and was promoted to Major. In the wars that followed, he served with the Army of the Rhine, always in the thick of the fighting, rapidly promoted and frequently wounded, a habit for which he became celebrated. In 1799 he was promoted to General of Division, and sent to Switzerland to serve as General Massena's new Chief of Staff, a role he performed to perfection. I owe the greatest praise to General Uno. He has assisted me in all my movements and seconded me and second me to perfection. He's a very good chief of staff then, um, at least it seems. Serving with General Bruhn in Italy, he led a cavalry charge against an Austrian battery at the Battle of Monzimbano, sabering gunners and capturing one cannon himself, a feat for which Napoleon awarded him a sword of honour. In 1805, the newly crowned Emperor Napoleon gave Oudinot command of an elite grenadier division, formed from the tallest, strongest soldiers in the army. Just looking at his promotion record, in 84 he enlisted as a private and he became general division in 99, so let's just make that 1800. That 16 years, and from private, which almost never happens today, I don't think there's a single general... Really, anywhere that was started as a private that became a general doesn't happen. But we're a peacetime army. Anyway, um, that, if you were to be an officer in a peacetime army, that would actually be a half decent promotion rate. Um, but he started promoting very fast when he became a major, you know, brigade and then division very fast. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Houdinot insisted on leading the division in person, despite having been shot in the thigh two weeks earlier. His grenadiers were kept in reserve for most of the battle, but saw heavy fighting in the latter stages, as Napoleon completed the destruction of the Allied left wing. At the Siege of Danzig in 1807, General Oudinot's division had the unusual distinction of capturing an enemy warship, a British sloop that had run aground trying to resupply the city. A month later... Just so you know, a sloop is not even a line frigate, or it's not even a frigate, and it's not a ship of the line, so it's not very... It's not very important to the Royal Navy, let's put it that way. At Friedland, Udino and his grenadiers were under Marshal Land's command, and played a crucial role holding up the Russian army. Until Napoleon arrived to deal a decisive blow. During the 1809 war with Austria, Oudinot was wounded once more at the Battle of Aspern. When Marshal Lann died of his wounds, Napoleon chose Oudinot to succeed him as commander of Second Corps. He led his new corps with such success at Wagram six weeks later that Napoleon attributed victory to Massena and Oudinot. A week later, he became one of three new marshals, one for France, one for the army, one for friendship. Udino, the army's choice, fearless and much loved, a man whose courage inspired all around him. He later received an additional reward, the title Duke of Reggio. In 1812, Marshal Udino led Second Corps into Russia, but was wounded again at Polotsk and handed over command to General Saint-Cyr. And as I remember General Sancir, in my opinion, was very good. Ten weeks later, he was back with his corps, marching south to join up with Napoleon's army on its retreat from Moscow. Udinot's men were shocked when they saw their old comrades from the main column. They looked more like fugitives than soldiers of the Grande Armée. Since Udinot's second corps was in better shape than most, it formed the vanguard for the desperate crossing of the Berezina River. But the next day, in bitter fighting to hold the bridgehead against the Russians, Udino was shot from his saddle. He was carried back to a cottage with a serious gunshot wound, but then he and his party became surrounded by Cossacks. Udino asked for his pistols, and from his bed, aiming through an opening opposite, began firing at the Cossacks. Well, he's a brave man, I'll give him that, at least. They were rescued by friendly troops, just in time. Oudino was back with the Grande Armée in Germany in 1813. In August, Napoleon ordered him to lead an advance on Berlin. 
but he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North at Grossbeeren. He then retreated in the wrong direction, causing Napoleon to remark, it's truly difficult to have less brains than the Duke of Reggio. That is a pretty critical error, I'm not gonna lie. In Udino's defense, he'd probably been given an impossible task. Insufficient men to take on a strong opponent, bad weather, terrible roads, and he himself unwell, possibly not yet recovered from his ordeal in Russia. Napoleon would... It makes sense, but retreating in a different... I have to look at that specific retreat, but yeah, retreating in a very wrong direction is not... Udino back where he was most effective, leading troops in combat under his close supervision. At Leipzig, he commanded two divisions of the Young Guard, engaged in heavy fighting on the southern front for two days. Boudinot continued to serve the Emperor courageously and loyally as a corps commander in the final campaign of 1814. But in April, he was one of several marshals to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position and force his abdication. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Oudinot refused to break his new oath to the monarchy, but declared neutrality, telling Napoleon, since I shall not serve you, sire, I shall serve no one. Probably didn't go down very well with the monarchy after, but... He continued to hold senior commands under the Bourbons. Never mind. By one estimate, Oudinot was wounded 36 times in his military career, more than any other marshal. Here are just 20 that we found details for. A fellow officer who bathed with him at a spa after the war saw the scars on his body and observed he was little more than a colander. That is insane to be wounded that many times. It'd be like 30-something purple hearts he would get. That's, that's insane. Um... These are like gunshot and saber wounds. They're not like a broken leg. These are not like minor, you know, cuts and scrapes and stuff. Fellow officer who bathed with him at a spa after the war saw the scars on his body and observed he was little more than a colander. Ironically, Udino... I believe a colander is a dead body that you can dissect at this time. ...was also one of the longest-lived marshals, dying aged 80 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. 11. Marshal Victor. Victor was better than one might suppose. I haven't heard much of Marshal Victor, so this ought to be interesting. Claude Victor Perrin was an experienced soldier by the time of the French Revolution, a sergeant with eight years' service in the Grenoble Artillery Regiment. The Revolutionary Wars brought the opportunity for rapid promotion, and by 1793, he was commanding an infantry battalion at the Siege of Toulon. He led a daring night assault on British defences, alongside the army's artillery chief, a young Major Bonaparte. Both men were wounded, but the attack was a success, and both were quickly promoted to Brigadier General. Victor served under General Bonaparte in Italy, and turned out to be a brilliant brigade commander. In 1800, he distinguished himself at the Battle of Marengo, where his command of the left wing won particular praise from Napoleon. So this man had been with Napoleon basically since the start, since uh, 1793, which is pretty rare. Uh, Victor commanded the army to the left, where he conducted himself with great bravery and intelligence. First Consul. But Victor did not hide his disapproval of Napoleon's quest for political power, and as a result, received relatively minor roles under the new regime. In 1802, he was earmarked to lead an expedition to recover the French territory of Louisiana. But it was called off when Napoleon decided instead to sell Louisiana to the United States. Which was probably the right call for Napoleon, because there was no way in hell and that man was going to be able to hold on to Louisiana with the British Canada being a thing. Uh, and that money would be very useful in the war. So. Victor and Marshal Lannes were close friends from their days serving together in Italy. In 1806, 
Lannes persuaded Napoleon to let him have Victor as his new chief of staff for Fifth Corps. Napoleon agreed, and in October, Victor served as Lannes' deputy at the Battle of Jena. The second in command, basically, chief of staff does all the orders, and second in command to Lannes. And Lannes is very good, so if Lannes is sticking out for this dude, it's probably pretty good. Napoleon's earlier misgivings about Victor were now forgotten. And that winter, he was given command of the newly formed 10th Corps. But within weeks, he was captured by a Prussian patrol and had to be exchanged for a captured Prussian officer, General von Blücher. Oof. Ooh, man. His big break came in 1807, stepping in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte to command 1st Corps at Friedland, where he successfully led a major attack as the Emperor looked on. Promotion to Marshal and the title Duke of Bellumo swiftly followed. In 1808, Marshal Victor and 1st Corps took part in the invasion of Spain, where he'd be posted for the next three years. Victor's record in Spain was better than most, but like others, he seemed more interested in personal glory and rewards than in cooperating with fellow commanders. In 1809, at Medellin, he inflicted a crushing defeat on General Cuesta's Spanish army. Four months later, his bold night attack on the British at Talavera came tantalizingly close to success. He was furious the next day when King Joseph and Marshal Jourdain refused to support fresh attacks and instead ordered a cautious withdrawal. The next year, Victor besieged the Spanish port of Cadiz. It proved a lengthy, futile operation, devoid of glory, and saw his troops defeated by an allied sortie at the Battle of Barossa. And did, because he was standing out. Yeah. Long story short, they were able to get around and surround him and kill him. In 1812, Victor was recalled from Spain for the invasion of Russia. His Ninth Corps was held in reserve for most of the campaign, though his troops were kept busy defending depots and convoys from Cossack raids. That autumn, his corps attempted to cover the main army's retreat from Moscow. The greatest crisis of the retreat came at the Berezina River. As the remnants of the Grande Armée began crossing over two improvised bridges, Victor's IX Corps was ordered to form the rearguard. Though heavily outnumbered, Victor skillfully handled his French and German troops, holding the Russians at bay as the army made its escape. He then marched his surviving troops over the bridges in good order. A courageous performance in desperate circumstances. Yeah, it really is. In Germany in 1813, Victor commanded 2nd Corps and led the attack in Napoleon's last great victory at Dresden. His corps was in heavy fighting again at Leipzig two months later. Victor continued to serve at the Emperor's side in the defence of France in 1814. By now, like many comrades, he must have been close to physical and psychological exhaustion. Regardless, during the Battle of Montereau, Napoleon let fly at him for failing to get his troops into position, and blamed him for the Allies' escape. Victor was relieved of command, but angry and humiliated at what he considered his unfair dismissal, he told the Emperor, Marshal Victor has not forgotten his old trade. I will shoulder a musket and take my place in the guard. Mo Pretty ballsy words. Moved by this response, Napoleon relented and gave Victor command of a corps of young guard. Two weeks later, he was badly wounded at the Battle of Craon and took no further part in the war. A month later, Napoleon abdicated, and Victor switched his loyalty to the Bourbon monarchy with surprising zeal. He led an investigation into former comrades who'd supported Napoleon during the Hundred Days and was one of only two active marshals to vote for the death penalty for Marshal Ney, a decision he later claimed to regret. Victor Whether he claimed to regret it or not, the decision was he did um, 
vote for Marshall Ney's death. Again, Marshall Ney was going to die either way because the king wanted him to. And uh, it wasn't just the marshals voting on this. It was like 400 people and more than half of them were loyal to the king. Um, so that was going to happen either way. But he did later regret it. So that leaves me at least one single marshal that actually voted for Ney's death. Think about that. Um, that actually wanted it. I don't know. We'll get to that one. Um, but otherwise, he did and then didn't, and they were regretted. Later served as Minister of War, but retired from public life in 1830, following the overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy. 10. Marshal Murat. I cannot conceive how so brave a man could be so unreliable. He was only brave when facing the enemy. In council, he was a fool with no judgment. I 100% agree with Napoleon. Ranking him number 10? I don't know about that one. Um, he was a very good cavalry corps commander, okay? And a very good cavalry man, okay? But he switched sides all the time. He was not very intelligent. Um, we'll see. Joachim Murat, the son of an innkeeper, was destined for a career in the church, but dropped out of college and joined a cavalry regiment instead. To his immense frustration, he saw little action in the early years of the Revolutionary Wars, being stuck with staff and training roles. But in 1795, while stationed in Paris with the 21st Chasseurs, fate intervened. A young general, Napoleon Bonaparte, had been put in charge of the defense of the National Convention. With a mob poised to storm the building, he ordered Captain Murat to bring him cannons, which he did, racing the guns through the city streets, allowing Napoleon to mow down the mob with a famous whiff of grape shot. Napoleon was hailed as the savior of the government and rewarded with command of the Army of Italy. Murat was promoted colonel and went with him as his new aide-de-camp. He soon made a name for him. Basically a secretary. Huh. Elf as a bold and brilliant leader of cavalry. While his six-foot height, curly locks and love of women ensured fame as France's foremost beau sabreur. In 1798, Murat joined Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. At the Battle of Aboukir, his flanking charge broke the enemy, and Murat personally took the Ottoman commander prisoner, despite being shot in the jaw, a wound which, to his immense relief, did not ruin his looks. Of course it didn't. Back in Paris, Napoleon launched his coup d'etat to seize political power. When he got a hostile reception from the Council of 500, it was Murat who saved the day leading troops in to clear the chamber, shouting, Citizens, you have been dissolved, before adding something a bit more coarse. His place at the future emperor. So he's up here mostly because he supported Napoleon politically, more or less, and he's a half-decent cavalry dude, at least from what it seems so far. Emperor's side was further assured when he married Napoleon's youngest sister, Caroline, in 1800. Later that year, he commanded the French Cavalry Reserve at Marengo, and helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Austrians. When Napoleon established his empire in 1804, Murat became a marshal, second in seniority only to Berthier. He'd later also received the title Prince of the Empire, and the rank of Grand Admiral. In the eight Man in command of ship. Yeah, he is important. He is second in seniority only to um, Berthier, which was Napoleon's basically chief of staff that ran his entire freaking army for him. 1805 campaign, he commanded Napoleon's cavalry reserve. His excellent reconnaissance and diversions proving crucial in the encirclement of General Max's Austrian army at Ulm. Three weeks later, Murat and Marshal Lann, who normally couldn't stand each other, together bluffed an Austrian commander into surrendering a vital bridge by persuading him that an armistice had been signed when it hadn't. It was a bold stunt, 
but overall... No and he apparently grabbed the freaking uh, firing thing from the artillery dude who's going to light the bridge to be exploded and be like, no, 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 you have surrendered. Napoleon was not impressed by Murat's pursuit of the enemy. I cannot approve your manner of march. You go on like a stunned fool, taking not the least notice of my orders. Yet in battle, Murat remained a brilliant and inspiring leader, as demonstrated at Austerlitz, and the next year at Jena, where he led the decisive charge, wielding only his riding crop. The next year, at Eylau, with the Russians poised to break through his centre, Napoleon ordered Murat to lead a mass cavalry charge straight at the enemy. Murat's men succeeded and saved the army from disaster, though at a terrible price in men and horses. Napoleon had rewarded Murat in 1806 by making him sovereign prince of the Grand Duchy of Berg. In 1808, he sent Murat to Spain to act as his... Actually, let me take a look. Hmm. Marshal's batons, France, Eagle... My coat of arms is very, not very good. I don't think that's the French background, but there's, there's a system to this, and the crown, so king instead of emperor. Okay. In 1808, he sent Murat to Spain to act as his representative. Spain was still a French ally, but in May, Napoleon's heavy-handed meddling in Spanish affairs triggered a ferocious backlash. Madrid rose up against the French garrison, and Murat's troops fought back with brutal force, killing around 200, executing 300 more. Okay, here's something funny. Well, back in college, well, I was actually studying this whole picture right here just to like break it down, like what is happening here from an Iranian TA, probably professor now. Um, but I just basically was like, hey, the French were in Madrid and you know, blah, 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 blah. Just a little tad bit. But um, this was created, I think this was created during the time to rev up support for um, Spain because of what the French did here. So, you know, more guerrillas and stuff. Around 200, executing 300 more. When Napoleon deposed Spain's Bourbon monarchy, Murat hoped he'd be made the new king of Spain. But that title went to Napoleon's brother, Joseph. Murat instead received the throne of Naples. If it felt like second prize, it wasn't bad going for an innkeeper's son, college dropout, and ex-cavalry trooper. Napoleon? It really wasn't to be king of Naples. Napoleon expected Murat to merely represent his interests in Naples, but Murat had other ideas. He reformed the Neapolitan army, equipping it with splendid new uniforms, and turned a blind eye to smuggling, which undermined Napoleon's economic war against Britain, the so-called continental system. Relations between Murat and the emperor became strained. But when Napoleon began planning to invade Russia in 1812, only Murat would do to lead his cavalry. Their differences were put to one side, Murat took command of four cavalry corps and became Napoleon's second in command. During the advance into Russia, Murat's cavalry... The only reason he became second in command is because my boy, Lands died. Long time actually before, before this. ...faced a difficult and frustrating task, trying to locate the enemy in a vast landscape. Horses died in their thousands from poor fodder and exhaustion and they faced a dangerous and wily opponent in Russia's Cossacks. Murat, always riding with the advance guard, was so fearless and conspicuous in his extravagant uniforms that the Cossacks came to admire him, calling out, Ura, Murat, whenever they saw him, and hoped to capture him alive if possible. Basically, he was like wearing a red coat in white snow. He wanted to be stand out, and they wanted, and he wanted people to know who he was. Ura was among those who tried to persuade Napoleon to halt the advance at Smolensk, but was ignored. 
Interesting. You actually had some brain cells. Be like, hey, but we can't actually push to Moscow. At the great clash between the French and Russian armies at Borodino, Murat was at his best, directing a series of attacks on the Russian earthworks, always where the action was hottest, inspiring all with his courage. Murat remained with the army during the retreat from Moscow, though his magnificent cavalry had virtually ceased to exist. One eyewitness noted that throughout the ordeal, he never neglected his appearance. Even at the Beretsina, he looked splendid, in an open-necked shirt, velvet cloak, a white feather in his cap. To me, his costume seemed utterly bizarre for such a moment and in minus 20 degrees. His neck was open, his valet cap was flung neg neg negligently over his shoulder, his black velvet cape adorned with a white feather. All this gave him the air of a hero in some melodrama, <laughs> Louise Frozen. Look, he is very much a drama queen, um, but it is actually kind of inspiring to see that when it's like freaking negative 20 degrees Celsius outside, but, you know. When Napoleon left the army to return to Paris, he gave command to Marshal Murat. But Murat, now primarily concerned with hanging on to his kingdom, left the army a month later and returned to Naples, where he opened secret negotiations with the coalition. He offered to join the war against Napoleon if the other powers would let him keep his crown. But he received only a lukewarm response. So in 1813, when Napoleon asked Murat to join him in Germany to fight for their thrones together, he answered the call. Although he was like, hey, can I get out? And they're like, maybe? And he's like, uh. Murat had become increasingly difficult to work with, oversensitive about his royal status, prone to tantrums, but in battle as fearless as ever. At Dresden, his charge through rain and mud shattered the Austrian left wing and paved the way for victory. But then at Liebert Volkwitz, he showed his limitations when not under Napoleon's direct command, getting drawn into a major and unnecessary cavalry battle with coalition forces, and twice nearly being captured himself. Two days later, at the Battle of Leipzig, he led another of history's great cavalry charges, coming close to breaking the enemy centre, and even capturing the Allied monarchs. And that was a big what-if, if that actually happened. But it was not to be. The Battle of the Nations ended in a disastrous defeat. As Napoleon retreated to the French frontier, Murat informed the Emperor that he was leaving for Naples, promising to raise fresh troops. Murat and Napoleon would never meet again. Three months later, the King of Naples had cut a deal with the coalition and switched sides. So long as it was possible for me to believe that the Emperor Napoleon was fighting to bring peace and glory to France, I fought loyally at his side, Murad declared. But now I know that the Emperor's sole desire is war. However, Murad's commitment to the Sixth Coalition was distinctly half-hearted. His army marched against Eugène's forces in northern Italy, but had done no actual fighting before news arrived of Napoleon's abdication. Murat then began to suspect what had been obvious to Napoleon at least. The coalition was not going to honour its promise, and Murat would be next to lose his throne. So in 1815, encouraged by news of Napoleon's return from exile, Murat marched north against the Austrians, proclaiming a war for Italian freedom and independence. He's not, he's not, he's not the brightest man. <clears throat> Maybe, probably, the coalition would have tried to get rid of him. But if he solidified his position, there's a lot of things he could have done to keep his throne in Naples, just to put it that way. And even if he lost it, he still would have been a very rich man. Um, they wouldn't have, like, put him in jail or anything, because he was in whatever for Napoleon. Anyway, but he decided now is a very good time to, which is, like, the absolute worst. If he wanted to do something, 1814 probably would have been a good idea, but... Just seven weeks later, his campaign ended in defeat at the Battle of Tolentino. 
With the British and Austrians closing in, Murat became a hunted fugitive. He sailed to France, but Napoleon had not forgiven his betrayal and refused to see him. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, he fled to Corsica, gathered a small band of volunteers and returned to Italy, in a hopelessly doomed attempt to start a revolution and reclaim his throne. Chased by a mob and arrested on the beach, Murat was sent Is this dude? to death by the restored Bourbon monarchy of Naples. He met his end with his usual courage, telling the firing squad, if you wish to spare me, aim at the heart, then gave the order to fire himself. He died like that honorably. Murat is rightly remembered as one of the great battlefield cavalry commanders of history. Inspirational, fearless, with brilliant tactical instinct. He's kind of like Alexander the Great if you chopped his brain out. That's what I would say. If you chopped Alexander's brain out and you just had like his 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 like brain uh, brainstem, right? So just tactical command and you put it I could see Mira being that. But you know, that versus Alexander. But outside of combat, he was in Napoleon's estimation a very poor general. He always waged war without maps. Worse, when the conflict turned against France, he allowed self-interest and vanity to prevail over loyalty to the Emperor. As Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, once told him, you're only a king by the grace of Napoleon and French blood. It's black ingratitude that's blinding you. Sancerre, Oudinot, Victor, Murat. 17 down, 9 to go. Join us for part 4 when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. And I, 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 I do really kind of agree with like 13, 12, 11, and 10. Maybe, maybe you could switch uh, Oudinot, Victor, and then move Sancerre up to 12, and then Victor back here. But yeah, Murat did have what he's going for him was basically a very good cavalry corps commander if Napoleon was there, which... And he had a long service career, which I understand why he's ranked number 10. Thanks again to our video sponsor, Blinkist. All right, so that's the end of the video. Hopefully you guys liked it. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe, and we will continue this series. Otherwise, you people have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.